Welcome to Big Oz Explorers. We've been touring in a caravan for over a year now and have learned a lot about how to manage in a tiny home while travelling around Australia. I'm Sean, and this is Chris and our kids Jada and Jack. Follow our family and live van life through our eyes while we take you on the trip of a lifetime around Australia's hotspots. Click the subscribe button to join our adventure every Thursday and stay up to date with everything Big Oz. Well, we just made it into town to Cervantes. So it's literally like a 10 minute drive. It's weird doing such big kilometers the last couple of weeks to going literally down the road. But um, yeah, we're down here for a couple of nights just to get a few things done. We've been off grid again for the last two days, get some washing done and just a few bits and pieces with a bit of reception because we were very limited with reception where we were. Um, it was kind of funny because you look at all the satellites, not all the satellites, but the uh, reception towers, is the word I'm looking for. And we were literally in like the only black spot pretty much on a whole coast. <laughs> I don't know how we jagged that, but we put in our new aerial in the caravan. Uh, we were actually getting reception. So we were just, just able to do a couple of things, not a lot, but it just goes to show how much that thing actually draws in, which is really, really promising and uh, exciting. Just quickly, while I was here, we noticed this for the first time when we were just leaving Geraldton. We took off and we had to pull over to grab something out of the caravan. And we got out and we looked down on the ground and all over the fence and into this paddock and it looked like white pebbles like and i mean in the hundreds of thousands if not millions there were so many and then in closer investigation there were snails there were like these little tiny white snails and i've just spotted more here oh i don't know what that was on my foot <laughs> We've spotted more here again because we've noticed it every now and again when we get out near trees, I know fence lines and stuff. Snails, they are everywhere. Apparently we Googled it and they are like one of the biggest pests on the West Coast. And the only way you can kill them is by fire. You've got to literally burn them all over. That sounds like something out of a bloody horror movie. But if I'll show you real quick, this is what they look like. They're just little white specks. But they're actually snails. I'm not going to get a couple off here. Look at that. Dead set, just snails. And they are everywhere. Like, the more you look for them, the more you notice them. But the, nearly every tree here has got snails all over it. Even these little white posts here. Check this out. There's a ton. Look at them all. Is that not the weirdest thing you've ever seen? I've never seen just a huge amount of snails in one area. Look at all. That is insane. Again, yeah, look, I'm not even kidding you. Everywhere you look. Another tree. Big pile of them. And then they're just all the way down and around. Nearly every one of these trees has got snails on it. Never ever ever knew that was even a thing until we seen them just coming out of Geraldton. Have you, have you ever seen that before? Let me know in the comments. Have you ever seen that many just random snails stuck to everything around you? It just blows my mind. I can't believe it. Anyway, fun fact, there you go. Lake Thetis is home to diverse microbial communities. The blister mat that the boardwalk traverses is a living community. Bacteria in the top layers of sediment release oxygen to form sand bubbles on the surface, hence the name blister mat, or in scientific terms, a crenulate mat. The rock-like platforms and domes are both stromatolites, but they are both built by different types of cyanobacteria. Lake conditions are 1.5 times saltier than the ocean, which supports very few predators, 
thus allowing the microbial communities to survive for thousands of years. Dark areas on the platforms and domes indicate wet, active growth of cyanobacteria, which continue constructing the stromatolites. The stromatolites you see that have holes within them have been damaged, mainly by humans. Deep in the middle of the lake, communities of purple sulphur bacteria form a sludgy, flocculent mat. Stormy weather may bring this purple sludge to the lake's edge. A wide buffer of vegetation helps maintain groundwater quality, which is essential for the survival of microbial communities at Lake Thetis. Joyce. He's only had 40 minutes sleep in the car. I even drove further down the road just to make sure he had a sleep, but um, still not good enough. But yeah, he's just, I don't know, the last week he's really just completely changed. He's now like proper two year old, oh, trouble, trouble, what are they? Terrible twos, they say. So yeah. <laughs> It just every day is like this now. It's just ridiculous. Like it's, it's crazy we get anything done. Yay, kids! Gotta love them. <laughs> so we've just pulled up to the Pinnacles. So we did a bit of a run around on Durian Bay this morning just to grab a few things from the post office. The last parcel we've been waiting for. Got some uh, coffee, a little bit of breakfast, and yeah, we've just been driving ever since. Give Jack a bit of a snooze. And we've just got in now, so there's two things. You can do the information center that gives you a bit of a rundown on why everything's here, um, what it's all about. So we're gonna go do that first. And then there's a drive you can do, which is about a 400 meter, I think they said. And it's a bit of a loop. You can drive around and take photos and pull up and go and have a look at the pinnacles up close, which is pretty cool. So pretty keen to go and do that after, get some really cool photos and yeah, see what it's all about. Mm. Don't you dare record me. I don't want to be on YouTube in this state. Look, what's dad got? What's this? What's that? So, hi YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh. big sucky bum. What's this? What did mum get for you this time? Is it a birdie? What is it? What sort of bird is it, Jack? Jack, what is it? What's this? What animal is it? What's it called? Uh, what is it? A bird. Yeah, but what sort of bird? What is it? Bird. A bird. <laughs> what sort of bird? Is it bird. A, is it an emu? Bird. Is it an emu? Uh, is it an emu? <laughs> It's an emu, look Jack. <laughs> oh my like, god, I just love it. It's a deal. And Jada got a colouring book. Oh. An Australian one. Hold on, let's light it up. Mm. It's got all Western Australia pictures to colour in. Nothing like a good practical book. It's got like colourful lines around the people so that I can. And you know what colours to do? Yeah, and I can trace it around them. I don't mind getting Jada like a souvenir if it's something that she can use and that to me is something she can use 
Jack's got a tiny fluffy toy, yes, but he's got basically none. Whoa. That's happens, why. It just happens every time. It doesn't, because otherwise goes you have shopping. a whole box of these things. Oh, stop. <laughs> I can't remember a time you've gone out without buying him something. No, that's not true. Yes, it is very true. It's not true. It is so true. We live in a caravan. We don't have room to buy something every time. No, like you just said, it's something small. So the smaller it is, the more you can buy. <laughs> the bigger it is, the less you can buy. I don't Whatever. know how it works. It's practical anyway. It's actually a puppet. It's a finger puppet. Oh, yeah. Not that I haven't shown him that yet. That's the next <laughs> thing. When he gets bored of it, I'll go, now look what it does. Is that the selling point, was it? For me, yeah. <laughs> finger puppet. Uh, so I gotta make sure that we don't tell him that until he gets bored of it. Yep. Yeah. Right, oh, so it's on to the drive. I'm going yeah. to check out the drive. Hi. It's only 400 meters, which is pretty cool. Hi, it's not too far. Say hi. What happened? Hi. Yeah, I just realized it was quite torn. I don't know how these things are still going. Like, they're, that's, <laughs> they've been through hell and back. Since before he was born. Yeah, literally. We've had them that long. That's only like two years. <laughs> Incredible. He does look after him though. It's his little baby. It's his like pride and joy. You can't get enough of these things. Hey, Mom, I don't know what he's gonna do when he doesn't need them anymore. Yeah. Separation anxiety. really cool you see photos and videos and stuff but to actually see something in person it's just incredible it really is very strange it's very random but so cool at the same time it's just mountains of little rocks and tall they're almost like termite mounds but it's stone so weird so Hiya. bloody weird Mom. Where's mum? Oh, there she is. Hi. Is she hiding? Hi. Yeah. What do you think, Jack? Is this cool? Mm. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Oh, you've seen the pinnacles. Mm. You're only two. <laughs> <laughs> Are you excited? Mm. Yeah. I did it. Oh, digger. Do you remember what he bloody diggers? Hey. Mm. Leaving your best life. <laughs> the yellow, pure yellow sand and all these structures, just thousands of them everywhere. Amazing. I didn't even have to tell him. What do you got your finger in his butt for? No. <laughs> hey Jack, what color is the ground? Like, Jack, what's this color? What color? Hello. 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 Yellow. Well done. Enough. Well done. What? Hey Jack, what color is? Stand up. What color is this? Hello. No, this one. Blue. Blue. <laughs> He's learning, he He's just can't there. speak. Very, very slowly. You're very clever. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Are you trying to make? Yeah, it's really cool. I'd, it's like they don't even know what they are. No, well, scientists still can't make out what they actually are, but it does make sense that it's all petrified wood. Like at some stage, this was a big forest with heaps of trees and stuff. Yeah. And it's just corroded and petrified over millions of years. So. There's a couple of them though, like the one that's next to us now looks like a stalag stalagmite. Might. Yeah, a stalagmite. But then there was one over there before and it looked like the center of a tree. You could see the rings in it. So yeah. I was like, oh, that looks like a tree. But then that doesn't. Yeah, it's interesting. 
having the camera out now and using it to have a lot more start to focus on things differently and landscapes and places you go you're looking for more unique shots and a bit more imagination that's one thing we have learned and picked up since being on the road and having a camera it's you see things totally different which is really really cool and it's interesting because it gives you a different perspective and it's not just the mainstream normal everyday sort of shots it's cool it's a whole new world photography and i can understand why people can get addicted to it and how you can get some just absolutely amazing shots those bits of like tree root bit tree root bits are up here they're talking about how they think that these are little tree roots and they're all hollow like this and they're all around the ground you can see them so i'm trying not to stand too close there's heaps of them aren't they yeah but like that would make sense i guess if they were the roots at some point and yeah. even like if you look at this that looks like a wooden grain but it's like rock yeah it does so it looks like polished wood with yeah, like yeah it's got all the like all the grain in yeah it. totally and here, like you can see all the grain marks in it. Yeah, 100%. I feel like up here is a little bit less walked. Yeah, it's a little less explored. Yeah, you can actually see what it's all about. So we went to that one bit before where you could see. Hang on. There we go, hello. The desert bit properly. And then we've just come around the corner and it says desert view from here. I was like, oh, that'd be typical, wouldn't it? You can see the perfect desert shot and there's actually a lookout and I went probably the long way. So I'll just try and find it. That was really cool, babe. What happened? So <laughs> I went to go up to this lookout, as I said to you, and um, I was taking a little time lapse of, oh, camera's still on, turn that off. I was taking a little time lapse of the desert because it looks really cool when the sun is like rolling over the desert and you can see it in a time lapse and sky moves and the like cloudy sky with the yellow ground. Anyway, um, there was a family up on the far mountain and the guy was singing. <laughs> I said to Chris over the radio, so I think there's someone singing on that top over there, like the hilltop, and with the wind, I could hear it in the wind, and it was kind of like, it was a moment, like a, a moment, you know, one of those moments, you're like, wow, something's happening over there. And then another man came and stood next to me, he said I was talking to him before, and he's actually um, come to teach his children about the ancestors in the area, and basically dream time stories, because traditionally, through Aboriginal culture, you don't read books, you teach through storytelling and that's exactly what he's here to do so he he lives in Carnarvon mm. but his ancestors are from this area so where he was standing up on the hill is an old fire area where they used to like have a fire pit and eat and socialize and everything together and in the dream time stories all the pinnacles in the area are actually the people that used to live here and the people were greedy and they took too much from the land which turned it into a desert and they all died apart from a few that moved out of the area and that's a reminder of who's left in the area now mm -hmm. um the remaining ancestors have moved out of there so his family have moved to Carnarvon there's others around the area but what he was saying is that by coming here and singing those songs and talking to the land the like in their dream time they're what would you say not gods but their spirits would be mm. happy with that and he said now there's no doubt that there will be a cold front that comes through the area and that's going to happen because the spirits of the area are going to be happy that their ancestors came and sung those songs and visited their heritage so there will be a cold front that comes through and causes rain because the spirits will be crying in happiness how crazy is that <laughs> wow so yeah i feel really like lucky that that just happened i just went yeah. and approached you and just said look i heard you singing and I'd love to hear more about what you're singing about and why you're doing that and he just took the time to sing a song for me and explain to me what he's teaching his kids so yeah well there you go and here's Jack in the back watching an iPad with god knows what blaring in the background but yeah that was a really <laughs> cool experience I'm yeah I left Chris in the car and I was like I've got to go and talk to this guy so yeah Oh well, it's bloody good timing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, did it, Maranga, Yambana, Nanga, go, Babanga, the Limano, Gordama. Yeah, did it, Ganyani, Baba, Gordama, Morgany, the Limano, Gordama, Barna, Baba. Honestly, that was.
Oh, I can't yeah. describe to you standing up on that lookout just then and listening to him sing over on these hills just here. Yeah, it was weird. Cool, yeah. He was ages away, but because the wind was coming my direction, I could hear him, and they were all standing there just like dead still and silently and just listening to their dad sing. It was really cool. It was, everything's changed technology-wise, yeah. like everything about how life used to be to what it is now. Yeah. So, so different. Like you used to have to rely on the land what was being grown at that time, plants, animals, everything. seasons, everything. Everybody needed to rely on those pinnacle times during yeah. the year to survive. But now we've got houses, we've got technology, we've got mass produced foods. Like <laughs> life is so different. And that's what I love about the Aboriginal side of things is because the things they learnt are like primitive. They're, I don't know, like you could literally live the way they did off the land without you, having you to rely on big farms and you know massively produced sort of meats and things like that like but then the people here were greedy and that's how they ended up with the desert yeah that's really weird like now driving through here having been told that by someone that these are spirits and like the way they see them is spirits in the area that's it changes it yeah it makes you think of it in a different way doesn't it yeah these are the people that lived here that were greedy <laughs> What better way to finish off a uh, adventurous morning to the Pinnacle than to come to the famous Lobster Shack? So this is the place where they serve the best lobsters apparently you can ever eat, and it's like I don't know. They rave about it. They reckon it's famous. <laughs> I don't know much about it, but the writing on it makes me think of um, oh, what's his name? Oh, the SpongeBob. Sponge, SpongeBob. Yeah, he looks like SpongeBob. Yeah, it looks like something. Yeah. It does. It does. Doesn't it? <laughs> So apparently if you want lobster and you want to get it fresh and you want the best feed you can possibly get, you come to Lobster Shack. This place is actually really big. It's huge. It's like a massive factory sort of setup going. There's sheds everywhere, solar. But yeah, I guess we'll go in and check it out and see what it looks like. Seafood. Seriously, I don't know if I can use this, but if I can, this is the most seafood I think I've ever eaten. <laughs> ever. That's true. I'm about to eat one of every single thing out of the ocean. Pretty much. Most seafood she's ever eaten 